Okay, I came home, I was repatriated from the prison camps in Vietnam of nearly six years in 1973. Um, I wanted to continue to fly airplanes, I wanted to continue to fly uh, in the military, which I did, as well as civilian airplanes. Well, I was in a, I was in a Navy Aero Club T-34 and lost a jug out in over western Kansas. When I, uh, when I uh, made this emergency landed in Hayes, Kansas, I had to wait for uh, two or three days to get a jug to put on that airplane. And so I started snooping around these hangars and barns in Hayes, Kansas, and I found four of these airplanes in pieces in Hayes. They were uh, one PT-19, a PT-26, and two PT-23s. Nearly all complete, but just in hundreds of pieces. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And so I found out the history was that this, the guy after World War II, had bought four these the four airplanes from his brother-in-law, who was a quartermaster in the army, and uh, picked out just the ones he wanted. They were all surplus. Paid about 500 bucks a piece for them. But he also bought a P-51, which was his downfall because he crashed and died in that. His widow, <laughs> his widow, didn't want anything to do with airplanes anymore, and so they sat in that barn in Hayes, Kansas for uh, 1946 and 1973 uh, and, and just collected dust, all right? It's pretty dry out there, so not too much rust. Huh? And uh, so so I went and knocked on the widow's door and said, uh, I'd like to take those off your hands. She said, what do you give me for it? I said, $2,400. I bought four of these airplanes for $2,400. I spent the next 17 years and $50,000 flying this airplane. <laughs> wow. So, and, and another way, my brother and I actually bought two up from the floor and then uh, cannibalized the rest of the parts and that kind of thing. So, but uh, that's pretty much the history of this airplane. I'm the second civilian owner of this airplane. And, uh, uh, of course, you know you know the history of the trainers, of the PTs in uh, in World War II, primary trainers, primarily this airplane, the Fairchild, and the Ryan, the PT-22, was the was the uh, airplane pretty much on the East Coast. This on the West Coast. This airplane, the Fairchild, was primarily on the East Coast mm -hmm. in training. There were 7,200 of these made, and um, as I as I researched this. Uh, I found that I could find most all the pieces except center sections and because they were outside a lot the center section which is a which is a piece of wood uh, well it's, it's laminated wood that runs from one tip to the, the uh, fuselage then out to the other tip is uh, is laminated um, uh, wood glued together but as it goes through the center section of this airplane it has all kinds of, of holes and brackets and all this stuff to house the controls uh, mechanisms and, and um, electrical and piping for the fuel and all this stuff. So um, most of the center sections that you will find in this airplane have either rotted away or they've been rebuilt. Rebuilding an intersection, which incidentally during World War II was built by uh, piano companies because they could work with wood mm. and the piano companies built a lot of the center sections of these airplanes they contracted out in World War II. Well, so some guys have rebuilt them but it takes forever to rebuild the center section. Uh, we had two good center sections, this one and the other one that we re rebuilt and the other two had dry rot. So. Um, so we, you know, we went to work, and uh, the, the, the history of rebuilding or renovating this airplane, the 17 years that I spent doing it, would fill a volume of all the people that showed up and said, "Oh, that's a great idea. Let me help you with that." And uh, you know, I'll take this wing out to my uh, out to my place in Colorado, and I'll uh, through the winter, and I'll have it for you next spring. Yeah, right. Uh, or uh, hey, I'll tow the airplane out to. Uh, to, to central Missouri where I can work on it and I'll get it back to you. And so I, 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 I had a lot of really interested people that were very motivated, but they didn't take much action on it. So that's why it took me 17 years to rebuild this airplane. One of the nicest airplanes I, I've ever flown, and I've flown everything from, from uh, F-4 Phantoms to F-18s uh, in, in the Navy to uh, 
uh, civilian airplanes of uh, all types. Uh, and, uh, and this is one of, the, uh, one of the easiest airplanes I've ever flown. One of the reasons is it's all push rods in this airplane. There are no pulleys or wires, and so the, the connections are direct. You move the stick and it immediately will move the ailerons or the, or the, uh, the, or the elevator. You, you just touch uh, the there's, pedal and it moves the rudder. There's no slack in them. There's no slack. No. And so what, what, how, how that um, impresses a pilot is that uh, all you have to do is think about uh, turning or climbing or diving in this airplane does it. It's very stable, you know. It's it's built for a 17-year-old kid from Kansas to uh, to jump in this airplane. My understanding is that they, they had six or eight hours of duel. And they turned these guys loose, so they had to build it like a tank. So it's very very strong. This the wings are covered with, with a laminate. It's 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 a wood it's a wood lamination. The fuselage is fabric. And as you can see, this is starting to deteriorate. This fabric is, was, was put on here in 1982. And so uh, it's done pretty well, but we're about to refinish this airplane. Of course, the, the engine the cell covered with aluminum. Um, a big old wooden prop, but I had to have this thing carved from Cincinnati out in Pennsylvania. Um, the, uh, just these, just these struts, you know, weigh 300 pounds, so it's it's not a light airplane at all. Um, big tires. This oleo comes down about oh I've forgotten a, a foot or 18 inches, so that when you touch down, it compresses the oleo and and gives you a very soft landing. You know the the old adage is uh, a good pilot brings an airplane down and lands it, and the passenger says, "Have we landed yet?" That's a good landing. That's a good landing. And very difficult to do in most airplanes. This one will do it. Oh, it's a, it's a great old airplane. And um, so I, I I I moved from from Kansas here back here, down here to California in uh, eighty um, three or eighty yeah eighty three or eighty four and uh, flew this airplane out here in the winter time. It was February. And so I uh, had a full snowmobile suit. I went to the Harley Davidson store and bought electric socks. I didn't realize that motorcycle riders use electric socks. <laughs> and I plumbed it into to the electrical system of this airplane to keep my to keep my feet. So you can feet fly warm. in February. Yeah, exactly. And um, it got pretty chilly because we had to you know come across some mountains and tw at 12.5 that uh, gets a little chilly. But it's a fine old airplane, and uh, it's fun to fly and fun to fly in. The open cockpit aspects, you know, makes you feel like you're a bird out there. So, yep. good to go. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I was uh, I was in the cell next door. To another man and we learned to communicate by tapping on the wall in a code that we devised where various numbers would represent different letters of the alphabet or abbreviations and so we tapped on walls and of course we had nothing else to do in the prison camps we had no books to read no window to look at no TV telephone nothing and so our entertainment was to secretly because they wouldn't let us talk to each other secretly tap on the wall um, to, uh, to to the prisoners next door. Uh, if you got if you, if you if you got caught doing that, you were in real deep trouble. And uh, so, but we were very careful not to get caught. But one of the guys next to me, and, and one of the things that we did, you know, after we ran out of telling everybody about it, and all the girls we dated and all the things we did, <laughs> all this stuff, uh, we started talking about hobbies and interests, and so. I would tell this guy about my sailing experiences and my Navy experience. He was an Air Force guy, and uh, he tapped back to me. He said, "I got this old antique airplane. It's a primary trailer, trainer, World War II, and I want to take you through a flight of this airplane." Well, you can imagine tapping on a wall where oh wow, 
uh, it takes a long time. So it took him about two or three weeks to describe uh, a 30-minute flight in his primary trainer, just like this one. And uh, I was fascinated by, um, I, I, I never really had any, any interest in antique airplanes, in primary trainers. I mean, I was a jet jockey off aircraft carriers, you know, I mean, it seemed to me that 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 was really a step down to go back to a trainer from World War II. Uh, but, but, but I was fascinated by the excitement that this guy had of, of flying this airplane. And so, um, and, and, and so that was kind of in the back of my mind when I found these and I thought, you know, I know a little bit about this stuff, not a whole lot. One of the, thing, one of the, one of the things he, he told me was that after every flight, he'd spend about 30 minutes cleaning the oil off the bottom of his airplane. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, you know, of course in the Navy, you just, you know, you, you turn it back to the mechanics and, and write up the gripes and they, they do all that. But, uh...